Today on Through the Bible, we learn some important lessons about judging people based on first impressions. I'm Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus. We're in 1 Samuel, and as we said last time, we're switching our attention from Saul to David. Now, as we make this transition, we stumble upon a very popular story that's usually told to children. Yep, you know the one, David's victory over Goliath. But stay tuned as our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, makes some very important applications that we adults need to hear as well. And to get started, here's Dr. McGee. We are accustomed to say that David slew the giant with a slingshot. You haven't told the whole story when you say that. You remember Luther said, one with God is a majority. David was bigger than the giant, not because there was anything in David, but it just happened to be that God was with him. I tell you, when you go into battle in this world today, friends, you better make sure God's with you because you can't win the battle without him. Well, that is so true, isn't it, Greg, that you can't win the battle without God? Oh, amen, amen. I feel that more and more, uh, and and we also are thrilled that the battle is being won as God's Word is getting into people's hearts and lives on the Bible bus. Yeah, and here's some examples of that. Here's Janet in Texas. Here's what she says. I'm grateful for the letters you share on the program, a recent one from a lady in New York who spoke about the importance of prayer really touched me. Even though I'm too old for mission work and can't give financially at this time, I can pray. Thanks for keeping Through the Bible going. I am blessed by the chapter-by-chapter, book-by-book teacher and Dr. McGee's wisdom and wit. Wow. Thank you, Janet. And thank you for praying. That is what we always ask for first and foremost. And also what I want to call out there is something we we encourage you to send your story in because notice how Janet was blessed and convicted by something that we got to share. So here's another one, a great response from Robert uh, all the way up in Massachusetts. And he writes this, I took Steve's New Year's challenge to read ahead in the scriptures for the next study. Wow. Way way to go, Robert. Wow. You're making Steve Schwetz really smile. That's great. All right. He goes on. At first, I thought it might make me late for work since I listen on the app in the morning as well as pray with the world prayer team. But somehow the Lord has been getting me to work even earlier than before. I enjoy seeing that I have underlined the same verses that Dr. McGee is emphasizing in the study. It is a confirmation from the Holy Spirit that I'm beginning to understand the great principles in the Word. I recommend everyone takes this simple step, reading ahead. Maybe next year I will take Steve's other advice (laughs) and also reread the day's scripture. After all, God is in charge of time, not the clock. Wow. (laughs) Love that. Yeah, that is such a a great word of encouragement. See, I feel convicted because you give me advice and I often ignore it. So (laughs) (laughs) now now I got to listen to Robert and maybe pay more attention. No, I actually listen to your advice because Steve is a wise man. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It is It is truly encouraging to see how, you know, going back to Janet's letter, how she was touched by someone else who was on the world prayer team. And we're starting to see that yes, more and more, yeah. how, how people are encouraging one another um, through a prayer that touches somebody else's life. So when you think about writing a letter into us, however you're going to correspond, remember that people are going to be blessed by your testimony and you're going to touch people's lives in ways that that we're not going to be able to with the program directly, yet they're going to be able to hear and be encouraged by what you're telling about how how your Christian life is growing and changing as a result of being exposed to God's Word. Absolutely. And we like you to focus on God and His Word, not so much us or Dr. McGee, yep. because that's what people need. They don't need us. They don't. He, Dr. McGee, we love him, yeah. but he would, he would say, we need the Word of God. Yeah. Greg, why don't you pray for us? Father, we're so encouraged. Thank you for the the positive, uplifting messages that we get to share with one another as we seek to, to study your word and, more importantly, just to follow you moment by moment in our lives. We bless you and pray that you would speak to us now in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, today our study brings us into 1 Samuel the 16th chapter. Now, if you have your Bible handy there, you'll want to turn and follow along with us. We are actually dealing here with a new subject altogether. We have brought on the stage now of human action, David, God's man, and we see him in contrast to Saul, Satan's man. 
And last time we saw the rejection of this man, Saul. God had given him not just one opportunity, but several opportunities to see if he would obey him, and he revealed that he was totally disobedient unto God. God gave him every opportunity. God has given other men, and they have made good, but not Saul. And the Lord didn't need to wait for the result. He already knew, but Saul needed to know. Samuel needed to know because he loved Saul, and the people needed to know because they had chosen him. And today, you and I need to know. I think that we're tested, and we do need the help of the Spirit of God because we're told that whom the Lord loveth, he testeth them. Actually, he chastens them. That has been God's method. It still is God's method today that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And not only that, we are told, blessed is the man that endureth testing. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. That's James 1.12. And so we see that this man Saul was tested, given ample opportunity, and he did not make good at all. Now, again, may I ask the question, why the extreme surgery in slaying the Amalekites and Agag? And I believe that, although I didn't have time to develop that last time, and I'm not taking time today, but I believe that when you get off and get a true perspective, Amalek was a son of Esau. The Amalekites were those that fought the children of Israel and destroyed them when they were trying to get into the land. And God said he'd have war with Amalek from generation to generation, that he would finally judge them. Now they've had probably 500 years to see what they're going to do, and they have definitely turned their back on God. And so he judges them. And somebody says, well, what about Agag? Well, that was the royal family. And we're going to find, if we move ahead 500 years, That was a man by the name of Haman. And if you check Esther 3.1, you'll find out he was an Agagite. Had Saul obeyed God, a great multitude of people would have been spared later on. You see, God knows the end from the beginning, and he knows what's best to do in any immediate situation, and you and I are in no position to give him suggestions and advice and sit in judgment of him. After all, he's the one to sit in judgment over us. Now we do come to the place where God chooses David as king to succeed Saul, and he's sending now Samuel to Bethlehem to anoint him as king. This man, David, was God's choice, and God had trouble with him. But doesn't he have trouble with all of us? He had trouble with David, and we'll see that as we advance into this book and the next one. All right, I'm reading... 1 Samuel 16, 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Believe me, Saul had someone who was on his side, and that was Samuel. Samuel loved him. He hated to see God set him aside. And that's the reason that when he gave to this man the ultimatum that he was dismissed as the king and he'd been rejected, it hurt him to do that and it makes it all the more impressive. Now we're told that God says to Samuel, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. And Saul certainly would have. Saul is not going to stand for anyone opposing him now. He's desperate. Notice, and the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord, and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And we find here, as we move on into this, that it is God that is the one that makes the choice here. And he's not giving to this man 
Samuel any advance information this time, and that, of course, will protect him. And we find now, as he moves on here, why he goes down to Bethlehem, and he comes to the house of Jesse. Now, I want to read verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, all through this section, we're meeting some great spiritual principles. Now, we saw in the last chapter that it had to do with this man Samuel saying to Saul to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. You and I demonstrate whether we are a child of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether we love him or not. It's not what we say in the testimony. It's whether we are obeying him or not, whether we are actually obedient unto him. You see, the Christian life is a life of reality. It's not a life of put on. It's not a life of pretense. It is a life of reality, and there must be that reality. And now we find here that God, when he looks at us, he looks at us actually from the inside. God is an interior decorator to begin with, and he always checks the interior of all of us. And we find that in this particular case here, God says to Samuel, now when you go down, don't look at his outward appearance. I don't judge by that. Let me pick the man this time. I'll pick the king. God sees the heart, and thank God for that. We are so apt to judge folk, even in Christian circles, by their looks, by their pocketbook, by their status symbols, the Cadillac they drive, or the home they live in, or the position they occupy. God never judges anyone on that basis at all. And so he's telling Samuel, he said, you don't pay any attention to the outward appearance. I'm looking at the heart. And so Jesse had his sons that were there to come and pass before him because Samuel made clear to Jesse why he'd come. And we're told here that these sons pass by. Well, he made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. That's verse 10. And then in verse 11 here of 1 Samuel 16, and Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, Well, there remaineth yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. And surely even the father of David would never have chosen him above the other seven older brothers. To begin with, he's a boy. It's believed that he was probably around 16 years old. I think he could have been younger than that. And he was out with the sheep. He didn't really know very much. And even Jesse's father would not have picked him ahead of his brethren to be a king. And he had just entirely ignored him. He was so sure it would have to be one of the seven sons. Now, when he finds out, that is when Samuel finds out that there is this little boy by the name of David out with sheep, Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? He said, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Samuel says this is important business, and I'm not about to sit down to rest or to eat or for any other purpose. I've come here to anoint the next king of Israel. And now notice verse 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. That means he was red-headed. David was a red-headed boy, and he had that kind of a temper. He had a hot temper. He was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance. And in spite of the fact he's red-headed, he was a fine-looking fellow. Now, this doesn't mean that God despises that which is beautiful, because God can use beauty. He's the creator of beauty. And no one that travels over this earth that we live in can refuse to ignore the many beautiful spots. All the states, you know, like to claim they have 
something that's quite unusual and that they have something more beautiful than the others. Well, I want to say that I've been in most of the states of this country, and all of them have something beautiful. Our God is a God of beauty, and a sunset in any state is sometimes a thing of glory. And God goes in for beauty. I resent today that the world gets everything that is beautiful, everything that's worthwhile. Why not these things be given to God and talent be given to God today? Well, this boy, David, he was a fine-looking fella. Don't misunderstand. I think he was a handsome young man. But God was not looking at that. God knew him. And we're told here he was goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now, this was God's choice. And God knew this boy. God knew what you and I don't know about him, that though he failed down beneath, that faith that failed was a faith that never failed, that this man did love God. He did trust him. He did want to walk with him. And God took him to the woodshed and beat him in an inch of his life. But let me tell you, he never whimpered or cried aloud. He wanted that fellowship with God, and God loved him. He's a man after God's own heart. Now we're told, and Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now we see the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who's a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Now, this man, I think, was completely taken over by Satan, that is, Saul. And his servants noted that he had this mental malady, that he had this spiritual sickness. And it is said that music, you know, has power to tame the savage breast. And so they have a contest to find out who's the great musician. Now, this boy David was a musician. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Now David was an unusual person, you see, in many ways. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass, laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor-bearer. David is brought now into the palace, and Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Now, this is the end of this chapter, and it tells the story of how David is to succeed in Saul's place as king over Israel. And we find here that God's method of choosing men for a particular office and task, God looks at the inner man. Saul now is forsaken of God, and David is brought into court to play up in his heart. Now, we have in chapter 17 one of the most familiar chapters, I guess, in the Bible, and I'm just going to hit the high points here because of the fact that it is familiar. We've all had this when we were in Sunday school, and this is the chapter that contains that familiar episode of David slaying Goliath with a slingshot. Well, you know the story, I'm sure, to a a certain extent. We're told now in verse 1, and I'm reading, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shokah, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shokah and Azekah, 
and Ephes Damon and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now here again is the war of Israel with the Philistines, their perennial and perpetual enemy, by the way. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Now they were at a standstill here. They were just waiting to enter the battle, and they didn't want to fight. It's sort of like what we had for so long down at the canal. Here's Israel on one side and Egypt on the other. Well, here it's the Philistines on one side of the mountain and Israel on the other, and a valley between. But here was the problem. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, if a cubit is 18 inches, this man's a pretty tall man, as you can see. That means that he was about nine feet tall in one span. It'd mean nine inches, nine feet, nine inches. He was a big boy, and he could have played center on anybody's basketball team or played forward, for that matter. He's a big fella, and certainly they want now to put the decision of the battle in the hands of this one man on one side and one on the side of Israel. And we're told that he had a helmet of brass upon his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. I'm not sure just how much that would be, but it was heavy. And we're told that the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Had to have one man to carry his shield. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Well, he did that every day, but didn't do a bit of good. Nobody's coming out. And David brought out food to his brothers. And when he got there, David was alarmed that no one would go out. And so his brothers try to send him home, but he's not about to go home. And when Saul heard about the fact that David would go against Goliath, well, he tried to put his armor on him, but David's just a boy. And he said, I'll just have to use what I'm acquainted to use. And by the way, what a lesson there is there, trying to be something that you're not or do something that you're really not called to do. And if God's called you to Use a slingshot, friends. Don't try to use a sword. If God has called you to speak, then speak. And if God's called you to do something else, well, you do that. And if God's called you to sing, sing. But if he hasn't called you to sing, for goodness sakes, don't sing. Today we have too many people that are trying to use a sword that really a slingshot's more their size. And so we find here that the thing that happens is that David goes out to meet him with a slingshot. And we're told in verse 40, he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Now, I've heard it said the reason he chose five smooth stones was because of the fact he thought if he missed with one, he'd use another. Well, David didn't intend to miss, friends. He didn't need but one, actually. Well, somebody says, well, why did he take five stones then? Well, if you turn over to Second Samuel, the 21st chapter, verse 22, you'd read this. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David, by the hand of his servants. You see, he had four sons, and David was sure those sons would come out when he slew the giant. And he had five stones. That's all he needed, friends. And you know the story. It's so familiar. David said to him, the battle is the Lord." And God gave him the victory, and the giant was slain. This is such a familiar story. We've gone over it rather hurriedly, but we'll be moving on next time in chapter 18. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. 
to listen to today's study again, you can visit ttb.org for a lot of different and free, by the way, ways to fit us into your day. Or you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you out. I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'm so grateful for you, and praise God for your testimonies. I'll meet you back here next time. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?